A couple weeks ago, uh, we were uh, wrapping up our study on uh, disciplines, and I indicated that uh, usually in the summertime, I, I do a special summer series that deals with an Old Testament individual. And we've done any number of them from Abraham to Moses to uh, Job to, uh, you know, uh, Joseph, and I could go on and on, Esther and Hannah. And, and we, 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 you know, and, and it's not that I've run out of characters in 10 years. I've done 10 different ones, but, but uh, um, this year in particular, I decided not to, not to concentrate on just one individual. Um, I, I have a book from Chuck Swindoll, and I, I apologize, I don't have the title right in front of me, but it deals with forgotten stories of forgotten people of the Old Testament. So each week, we will deal with a different individual from the Old Testament. But this is sort of an introduction this week to, to that sermon series. And uh, um, in doing so, in introducing you, I thought maybe the best way uh, to do that would be to have a little quiz. So if everybody would close their books and get out a sheet of notebook paper. <laughs> you know, a, they probably don't even say that anymore. You know, that's what they all used to say when I was in school. You know, yeah, close your books and take out a piece of notebook paper. It's time for a little quiz. Uh, anyways, I thought we'd have you do a little quiz here this morning. I'm going to ask you six questions, sort of quiz you a little bit, and you see how many of these you know the answer to. Okay? Who? Then question number one. Who taught Martin Luther his theology and inspired his translation of the Bible from Latin to German? Everybody got that one? Yeah, that, that was uh, Johann von Stupitz. I'm probably not pronouncing that right, but you get the idea. So I interview you know the correct pronunciation or knows uh, uh, Johann, uh, give him my apology. Okay, question number two. Who spoke to D.L. Moody in a shoe store one day, leading Moody to accept Christ and ultimately into a life of evangelism? Raise your hands if you know. I'm sorry, I heard a name. Edward Kimball is the correct answer. Everybody familiar with Edward? Yeah. Who was the elderly lady who prayed for Billy Graham every day of her adult life, otherwise known as a little old lady from Pasadena? Everybody know? Pearl Goody. Pearl Goody. Yeah. Question number four. Who succeeded Hudson Taylor at the China Inland Mission, providing remarkable direction and vision for years for that ministry? You got it? Anybody got it? Jackie Chan. Jackie Chan? <laughs> 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 Some of my patients. <laughs> they mean, you me on something. I don't Dixon Edward Host. Question number five, who was the wife of Charles Hayden Spurgeon, England's prince of the pulpit, quite possibly the most influential voice in the Christian world over the past two centuries? Mrs. Spurgeon. That's right! <laughs> Otherwise referred to as Susanna. Finally, who gave Charles Wesley his start as a composer, starting down the road over uh, writing over 6,500 hymns. Close, you got this one? Go ahead. Shout it out. What's, what's the answer? Who gave Charles Wesley his start as a composer? You know, I, I, I'll be honest, because I looked all these up, and I sort of find this one. But I do know who led him to Christ, so I went with that, George Whitfield, so, uh, uh, which is a recognizable name. Most people uh, have heard that name before. Okay, anyways, I'm going to now ask you to raise your hand if you got all six right. Let me get five, four, three, two. Let me get a single one of those right. Oh, I know. Mrs. Spurgeon, right? Yeah. I'm with you, Elizabeth. You know, it, it's really pretty amazing. It really is how different the history of the church would look but for these six forgotten saints. Think about it. The impact they had on incredible ministries. The reality that I'm trying to reinforce here this morning is simply this. 
Maybe you are a Sunday school teacher, just maybe teaching elementary school school students, or, or maybe you are a volunteer for the for the diaper ministry, or or, or or maybe you are part of the drama team or the prayer team. Um, maybe you're a part of the music ministry, whatever the case may be. Maybe you're just somebody who everywhere you go, you share your Savior, Jesus Christ, with others. Here's what I want to say. You never know the lives you may be impacting for Jesus Christ. Just like these six forgotten saints that I just mentioned. You might be instrumental in God's plan of raising up the next great evangelist. The next Billy Graham. You don't know. And it really goes beyond the church, right? These sort of forgotten people. These sort of forgotten people. Because with God, nobody's forgotten. With God, nobody's insignificant. There are a lot of people in the world around us, not, involved, not associated with the church, that may not be known, may be forgotten, but are kind of a big deal, right? As my buddy Dionysius would say, kind of a big deal. Like, how about the airplane mechanic who prepares the plane that you're about to take off on? Do you know his name? No. Is he significant? Peter does a lot of traveling. Is that guy significant to you, Peter? <laughs> Very significant. Or the nurse who stands side by side with the heart surgeon who uh, opens up your chest and, and takes out your heart and, and, and then she's the one handing him the proper sterile instrument at just the right moment. Is she a big deal? Bob Holt, is she a big deal? Yes, she is. Yeah. Does yes. anybody know her name? Yes, I do. Oh, <laughs> All right, Bob, don't take me there. <laughs> right. The person who does your lab work, your blood work, your x-rays, they're, they're not necessarily known, but they play a major role. They could hold your life in their hands. And there might be a temptation to say that these people are nobodies, right? Who are they? They're nobodies. But I guess what I'm trying to say is this, that when it comes to God's children, nobody is insignificant. Everybody's a someone in God's world. Let us pray. Fathers, we refl reflect now upon your word. I pray that you would uh, touch us, lead us, guide us, and direct us uh, to your paths of righteousness through your truth found in your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. I'm going to read to you some scripture in a few moments, but I, but I have a few more things I want to share before I get to our scripture today, uh, just by way of uh, almost an introduction. Um, as we talk about those who are considered significant, important people in the world, we, we, you might be tempted to say, well, the most significant people are, I don't know, people you recognize, like, let's say, actors or, or athletes or, or musicians. Say, well, those are the most significant people. The people that we applaud, the people whose jerseys we put on our back, right, Jamie? Like Juju Smith Schuster. Yeah, I've seen you wear his jersey around here before. Yeah. People we seek out their autographs. Guess what? They're not really the most insignificant people, though. They're really not. You see, because oftentimes it is the seemingly insignificant people in the world who end up turning somebody's life around, who play a prominent role. Some of the examples we've already stated here this morning would suggest. And it happens all the time in the Bible. All the time when you turn to God's Word. Let me give you an example. How many of you have heard of David? King David, let me say. Anybody here heard of King David? You know, he slayed Goliath with his slingshot. He, uh, well, the masses quickly caught on. They proclaimed that Saul killed his thousands, but David, his ten thousands. Saul, the present king, would go on, go on to, 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 to seek to hunt David down. He would try to kill David. And for years, David would have to sleep in the wilderness. He would have to, to, uh, to eat off of the land. But along the way, he attracted a large number of men who were supporters, who were his fighting men. And they walked alongside him every step of the way. And, and, then, and then, as God protected David through the years, Saul would die, and David would ascend to the throne at about the age of 30. And he would reign for 40 years as Israel's second king. And as we approach the end of his reign, 
Historians began to gather around him. They would approach David and they would ask him, what were some of the most significant events of your, of your reign, of your life for that matter? Because we want to record them so that they'll be known for all ages. Now one might think that David and all of his accomplishments uh, would want to brag a little bit at this point in time, right? You might want to recall the glory years, detail how he was a brilliant commander, how he was a courageous warrior, a wise statement, statesman. I mean, he could have done that because he certainly fit that description on every count. But instead, as they gather around him, he would recall the names of people he considered true heroes in his rise to power. He would speak of the original band of brothers, whom the Bible calls the 30, just the 30. And then in, in 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 23, verses 8 to 12, we read of David's recognition of three in particular, three remarkable generals who were instrumental in his rise to power. Three men who were virtually forgotten by everybody, but not by David. We first read of a man named Adino. Anybody familiar with that name, Adino? Oh, Josh, I thought for sure you would raise your hand. <laughs> Adino! He didn't do much. Simply killed 800 of the enemy in one single battle. 800 in one single battle, and he did not have a rapid fire machine gun. 800 men he killed with his sword. Kind of a big deal, right? But who remembers Adino? I mean, does that name Adino just roll off your tongue when you think of heroes of the Bible? Is that a name you think about? The next person David recognizes is Eliezer. Eliezer. You see, with most of Israel's army hunkered down in, in, in foxholes and in the bunkers of that day, it was Eliezer who single-handedly attacked the arch enemy, the Philistines. And he stayed there so long that the Bible tells us his comrades ultimately had to pry his sword from his hands. That's what it says in 2 Samuel 23. Finally, David remembers Shema. You see, when confronted once again with the Philistine army, all of Shema, Shema's uh, companions, they ran away like scared little puppy dogs. But Shema stood his ground all by himself. You can read the details. They're right there. 2 Samuel chapter 23. Um, but, but, but here's the thing. David wanted the world to know for all time, wanted the world to know how significant these three men were to him. He could have recorded anything, but this is what he talks about. How they helped him become who he became. Who he was. To David, these three men were the real heroes. They were the heroes. Still, who remembers Adina or Eliezer or, or, or Shane? Who remembers those names? What I'm saying is, with God, everybody's a somebody. Everybody is a somebody. And that takes us to our scripture I want to share with you this morning. It, it is uh, Acts chapter 23. If you'd like to open up your Bibles, Acts 23. Begin, beginning with verse number 12, we'll turn to the New Testament. Subtitle, The Plot to Kill Paul. Luke writes these words. He says, The next morning the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they had killed Paul. More than 40 men were involved in this plot. They went to the chief priests and the elders and they said, we have taken a solemn oath not to eat anything till we have killed Paul. Now then, you and the Sanhedrin petitioned the commander to bring him before you on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about his case. We are ready to kill him before he gets here. But when the son of Paul's sister heard of this plot, he went into the barracks and he told Paul. And then Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the commander. He had something to tell him. So, so he took him to the commander. The centurion said, Paul, 
the prisoner sent for me and asked me to bring this young man to you because he has something to tell you. The commander took this young man, took him by the hand and drew him aside and asked, what is it you want to tell me? He said that the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul before the Sanhedrin tomorrow on the pretext of wanting more accurate information about him. Don't give in to them because more than 40 of them are waiting in ambush for him. They have taken an oath not to eat or drink until they have killed him. They are ready now, waiting for your consent to their request. The commander dismissed the young man and cautioned him, don't tell anyone that you have reported this to me. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading and this hearing of his holy word. Pretty powerful stuff, right? A plot to kill Paul, but for one individual. So let me ask you just one question. What was the boy's name? This boy? Paul's nephew. Paul's nephew. Okay, that's sort of like Spurgeon's wife. Okay. <laughs> yeah, Paul's nephew. We are never told the name of Paul's nephew. But I guarantee you it's not because he was not significant. I mean, think about it. Without this young man, it is possible that Paul never gets to Rome, right? Maybe there are no letters to the Ephesians, the Philippians, or the Colossians, let alone Timothy and Titus. Without this boy, Paul's testimony before the great course would probably never have been heard. How do you suppose this all would have impacted history? The history of the church. Now, don't get me wrong. Don't get me wrong. I don't want to weigh in, in any way discount the sovereignty of God. I, I, I don't want to dismiss that. God's faithfulness to his servants. It, 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 it's going on here. But this young man is certainly a part of God's plan, right? I mean, I'm just saying what seems insignificant. Uh, just a young boy. The son, Paul's sister. What seems insignificant is oftentimes forgotten. Nobody thinks of this name or, or even to wonder what his name was. But in God's kingdom, it's very significant. In his plan, it's a big deal. And it's no different with us today in God's church, right? It's no, I mean, in, in the local church, in our church, in First Baptist Church of Monroeville, it depends upon you and I, upon the faithful people which to the rest of the world might seem insignificant, right? But every one of you, every one of you make up potentially what First Baptist Church of Monroe is capable of accomplishing. You know, a lot of times as a pastor, I get the opportunity and privilege of being all alone in this building. Just me. Just me. And, and, and I got to tell you, in those moments when I'm all alone in this building, this church is not very exciting. It really is. If there are no lights on, there is no music, there is no laughter, no fellowship, no worship, no prayer, but, but for my prayer, of course. No singing, uh, but for mine. And that's, I mean, I don't like to listen to my own singing. Um, I walk through the sanctuary on a Monday morning. And Gloria is off, and, and I'll come in here to pick up my notes. And this place is like an abandoned warehouse. Without you, this is nothing. This building is nothing. You know, it really isn't. The, the, the church, church thrives or doesn't thrive because of you. Every one of you. When we come together with a common vision, a vision that comes from God, then the sky is a limit. And even though you may feel like a nobody, you and I have a lasting significance and a wonderful opportunity to touch lives for our Savior Jesus Christ. Right, right here in this sanctuary, out in the streets of Monroeville. Uh, how how was like you put that? To infinity. And we don't know the limits. There are no limits of our, of our opportunity to have an impact on the lives of other people. We don't know 
when we are going to be that person who helps helps bring somebody to Christ, who will uh, two generations down tell somebody else about Christ and then be the next great event. We don't know the lives we are touching when we are sharing the love of Jesus with the people around us. You know, it, it, you know in the world's eyes, maybe you all don't seem all that significant. In your own eyes, you may struggle to see your own significant, but in God's eyes, in His estimation, you are kind of a big deal. Every one of you. Every one of them. The Robert Kennedys who come up here and sing a song and lead us into worship, clapping our hands and praising the Lord. You are not insignificant. Every one of you has a role to play in his kingdom, in his plan. You are kind of a big deal. You really are. And the question might be, how big a deal? How big a deal are you? How much impact can you have or will you have in your own home, in this church, in the community, people around you? And, and maybe uh, the, the further question might be, uh, when it comes to impact, will it be a positive impact or a negative impact, right? Because you can impact both ways, positively and negatively. I'm here to tell you today, a lot of it has to do with the choices you make. The choices you make as you go forward in your walk. You know, if you... You are a person of great significance. That's the reality. God tells you that. God sees that in you. If you want to, to take that to the max, I want to share with you just four things, four simple things, four short things that might, that might be present in virtually every person of great impact. Some of these we've talked about before in different messages about different topics, but they have a, a place in the role of a Christian who is attempting to impact lives for, for their Savior. Here, here's the first thing I want to share with you. You want to be a person of great impact. Virtually all people who have great impact on the lives of those around them might be referred to as people of selfless devotion. Selfless devotion. What, what do we mean by that? No, it's simply this. People who tend to make the greatest impact on others don't care who gets the credit. Doesn't matter to them who gets the credit. Frankly, they don't complain about the role that they have to take on and I'm more important than, than, than that task that you've set before me. They don't complain. They do whatever they need to do. And it's going to be a tough one. It really can't, right? Because complaining, I found, not with any of you. Never heard any of you complain. But even within Christian circles, it seems to run rampant. It just seems to come natural to complain. There are a lot of glory seekers out there who, who, who want to make it about them. They claim they're serving in the name of Jesus. But in essence, they're trying to escalate their own name. That's so I wish... I truly wish I could stand here before you and say I've never been guilty of this. But I have. I think sometimes pastors can be the most guilty of this. They have to caution themselves more than anybody else to make sure it's always about him and not about me. Selfless devotion. You want to impact lives for Jesus. You need to be a person of selfless devotion. When David recounts these heroes in, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, when he goes through the story what you don't read about is a single complaint from any of these great generals. You, know, you don't read about how one of them wanted all the glory. They were selflessly devoted to David. The cause was greater than any one individual. Selfless devotion. Common trait amongst almost all those who have a great impact on others. Secondly, you need to have what might be referred to as a mission focus. Meaning you stay focused on the mission. You stay focused on the goal. These sort of folks who impact lives greatly, they don't get bogged down in the minutia. They know what's at stake and with God's help they attempt as best as they can to stay on task. Not to, not to get uh, off track, which is so easy to do, even in ministry, right? 
Thirdly, people who have a significant impact on others are people who walk, work in harmony with others. Meaning they set aside their own personal agendas. It's not about them or what they think. They set aside differences of opinion in order to achieve the greater good. Those three generals that David recognizes in, in, in 2 Samuel chapter 23, they were unified in their objective. And that objective was to see that, that David ascended to the throne. And when, when he reached that objective and they helped him accomplish it, the Bible tells us that they sat down for a celebration. And in their words, which are recorded in 1 Chronicles chapter 12, what they said was this. In essence, they said, David, this is one of, one of the greatest moments of our lives. They didn't get the glory, but they worked hand in hand so God's plan would come to fruition and David would ascend to the throne. David could not have achieved what he achieved without them. And they could not have achieved it unless they worked together in harmony with one another. Finally, people who have the greatest impact on others have what we like to call a contagious joy. They have a contagious joy. I want you to think about your life and the people that who, who have impacted you in a positive way, the greatest. Almost always, these people have a, a zest for life, a joy that wells up within them. It has been said that joy, joyful people rarely leave a room the same way they found it. We need to attempt to be that sort of joyful person. Just four things you might ask. How am I doing in these areas? How am I doing? Over the next couple of months, we're, we're going to be focusing on forgotten stories, on forgotten lives uh, from the Bible. And as we do, hopefully you begin to see a trend because it's there. Throughout the pages of Scripture, it is there. You begin to see how God uses seemingly insignificant people over and over again in very significant ways. And so if you're sitting here today and you're feeling kind of small, insignificant, or forgotten, you need to be reminded that with God, everybody's a somebody. Let's pray. Father, as we reflect upon your word and these examples of those who, who you've placed before us in your holy word, Lord, we are humbled to think that we, those gathered here at First Baptist Memorial, we are part of your master plan to have an impact on the lives of those around us in our homes and in our workplace and in our neighborhoods and in this church and everywhere we go. We're not insignificant. We are somebody. Lord, we pray that you would give us the boldness to, uh, to go out and, and be that person you've called us to be. With selfless devotion, working in, in harmony with others, with a joy that is contagious, Lord, that will draw others to you and to your Son, Jesus Christ. In whose name we pray. Amen. Amen.